guys got video bluff for you, man. This is a tough one, man. It's no easy task here. This is um, something that every living being goes through. Um, it's depression, man. Depression. Um, it's, uh, this goes well outside bodybuilding. It exists in the fitness world, in the gym, it exists in life, relationships, careers, financial situations, um, at young ages and old ages and everything in between. Um, it has no prejudgment, um, whether you're old, young, fat, thin, male, female, black, white, there's no prejudgment here. Everyone has it. And um, it's usually seen as a negative, you know, the prostate. It's derived from the Latin term of, you know, when something has, is being depressed upon, you know, pressure's on them. Um, the actual definition, if you look up, uh, look it up, I'll just read you the definition here. Um, I got these fucking glasses on now these days, guys, because I'm on the computer all the time for you. And uh, my eyesight's gone to shit. Uh, but anyway, it goes, a severe disparity and rejection, typically felt over a period of time, and accompanied by feelings of hopelessness and in, 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 inadequacy. Uh, the act of lowering something or depressing um, something down, or pressing down. Um, negative, right? It's all, all negative, all negative. Um, I really don't think so. Um, I don't find depression as negative. I have a different definition for it. I have it as um, a luxury. I think definition is a luxury. Um, because someone is not in a survival state, they're in a self-pity state. That's a luxury to be depressed, I feel. Um, I feel it's a tool of self-discovery. And if you're strong enough to face it, is a multiplier in your life to reach the levels of, of happiness you've never felt before. It's the, 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 it's the rebound effect of life that really drives who somebody is. And I've said this before, I think your greatest hour is usually followed right after your worst hour of despair. You have to find out what you're all made of. Yeah, it's really easy to hide in success and good fortune and when things are going well and everyone's loving and you're a party and everyone gonna be happy then, but who are you? When all that's gone, all the cheers are gone, uh, the money's gone, they, you know, the opportunities are gone. I mean, who is that person? Because that's the person that created it once, and if that person still remains true to themselves, it will create it again. We get to find out who we are. There's a lot of self discovery there. If you're feeling depressed and you're feeling down and out and everything else, it means that you are not doing the path of which you know you can do. You're doing something that's, that's against the grain of your will and your, your existence, what you believe in. If you really look at it, focus it, have an honest truth to it, and face it in the eyes, you're going to find it as a multiplier. It's going to be a tool of self-discovery self where you're going to find out what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, and how to fix the motherfucker into a path, a direction that you want to achieve something that, 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 that goes hand in hand congruently to what you want to be. You can't keep on doing the same thing and expect it to be better. You have to create it better. I also feel depression is a, a, a state of which one is, has lost self-perspective on something. You know, the truth, how strong that is, the underlying truth society goes by, isn't as strong as the individual's will and ability to see it. The self-perception, the way someone sees something is stronger than what the truth really is held by the majority stake. This email that I'm talking about self-depression versus I mean, uh, depression versus self-perception. This email comes from a guy named Cam. He's having a tough time here. I'm going to read it. I'm going to go through a lot of examples, guys, that I've gone through in my life. I continue to go through how I dealt with them. I'm going to give you some examples of people I ran into. And well, the underlying thing here is that the, the situation is depressed because the individual allows it to live. Depression is a state of mind, not a state of reality. I can give you situations where you're like, wow, that life is awesome. You know, compared to that life. But then again, that person in the life that you said wasn't so awesome is happy, and the other person that has everything is, isn't happy. So it, it's, it's, it's a state of mind in how you see something. Let me read you this email. It comes from a, a, a young guy named Cam, uh, 17 years old in, in, in Ottawa. And um, let me read you the email, and then um, we'll get into this, man. It's, it's something I think that, you know, it really exists in all theaters of life, man. Whether you're, uh, you're young, you're old, you're fat, you're thin, you're male, female, black, white, you know, have money, broke, I mean, everything. Every living being goes through this, you know? And multiple times, it's the EKG of life, there's ups, there's downs. Who are you in the ups? And are you the same person in the downs? If you are, you're solid. Depression then is, it, it isn't an issue. It's just a situation of which you find discovery in and reboot your system onto the path of excellence that you know you can be. Cam writes, Hey Greg, my name is Cam, I'm 17 years old, kid in Ottawa, Kent, uh, Ontario. 
Last um, last half year of my life has been pretty crazy, man. Got together with my girl, and five days later, my best friend passed away. Never gone through something like that. It was so hard. Three weeks after he passed away, I found out my parents were separating. I've been dealing with this ever since. Every day I would just come home from school, lock myself in my room, and just stay there and wait till my girlfriend would come over. She's the reason I can still smile. I don't want to sound weak or anything, man, but life has just constantly been kicking me while I'm already down. Dealing with all this shit my senior year, it sucks. I don't want to make this too long because I really want to get a response from you, so I'll just be straight up. I'm losing my motivation. I used to be so great, man. Not being cocky, but I would get up every day, 6 a.m., and work out, had a ripped body, the best diet. People were inspired from me. I helped my dad lose 20 pounds. I mean, people were always coming up to me for help and motivation. It was amazing. And I fucking lost it. I can't even look in the fucking mirror anymore. I feel like such a failure looking at what I've become. Sorry for the language, but I just want to hear a response from you. I know you don't know me, but you're such an important person in my life. Love all the work you do. You help so many people. That's why you're number one. I have big dreams of playing the NHL, becoming a fitness model like you. I just want to. I just want that dream not to die, man. I need your help. He goes, P.S. Do I have the human? Uh, do I, as a human being, have the right to walk away from people who I feel constantly hurting me, no matter what their role is, A.K.A. my father, mother, aunt, or uncle, etc. Really hope I hear back from you. Doing the best I can to stay strong. Thanks, man. Cam. Um, Cam. Um, well, man. Uh, you paint a really tough story there. My heart goes out to you. Um, no one can expect a, a best friend dying. No one's ready for that day. Even if someone's giving word of it. Like my dog Quest is dying. Um, cancer, it's terminal, it can't be operable. Um, and uh, it can't be treated on, I've tried everything possibly I can. And um, I was told last, a year ago, she wouldn't make it to July 4th. She has lasted 15 months. Um, so she's definitely in bar time, has a strong will. Uh, but a huge tumor growing out of her. And I know that that day is coming, it's, in, it's irreversible. Um, the anticipation of death is worth the death of itself. Knowing this, knowing I have an extra year with her, has been a blessing, but also a, a, um, a, a curse, because there's nothing I can physically do to reverse it. You know, every day I see her get thinner and thinner, and she's starting to bleed a lot, and it's just, you know, someone you care for so much. You know, I wish she just got hit by a car one day, it'd be easier, but you know, you can never prepare for that day. So I, I'm not gonna be hard on you. It's hard to lose somebody you care so much for. Then your parents separating. And um, in that situation, the man's rough, man. You thank God you had your girl right there to help you and everything else. That story you painted is, is terrible. And I understand how you're feeling depressed. But like I said, man, depression is really just the inability of self-perception. So let me paint you another story real fast. The story is this. You, you're, you're with your girl having a good time, right? Your best friend's with you too. And um, your mom and dad give you a call. Say, hey, come on over for, for dinner. You're in the car, you're driving over there and stuff, and there's a car accident. Your best friend dies in the car accident. You lose your leg. Your girlfriend's a paraplegic. Your mom comes running up to the hospital, I mean, to the hospital and everything else, and your dad comes a little bit later. They break the news that they're going to get a divorce. They get in a huge argument right there. Later on, your dad shoots and kills your mom. You're like, Greg, what are you doing, man? You just, this, what are you doing? This sucks. What I'm trying to show you is that if you, if that was reality, why just painting it there? That like your girlfriend's a paraplegic, you lost your leg, can't work out anymore. Your best friend died in your arms when you were driving the car. So now you're responsible for his death. Your parents didn't just get a divorce; they hate each other so much. Your father is in jail now because he killed his mother. If you were to live in that story I just painted, you would give everything you had to move from that situation into the situation you wrote the letter on. Would you not? Yes, you would, because it's not as bad. They say it can always get worse. Well, it can always get better too. It's the perception of the mindset. The reality isn't wrong. It's the way you see the reality. The worst thing about your letter there is that you said you once were great, man. You were so great. Well, 
everything you told me about that has nothing to do with you. You can't control life. You can't control if your best friend dies or not. Your ability is still the same. Your girlfriend having her or not having you, you're still the same person. Your parents being together or not is outside of who you are, the internal person, the will and the drive, the motivation, the pride within. You're going to the gym at 6 a.m., your girlfriend didn't get you there. Your fucking best friend didn't get you there. Your parents didn't get you there. You got yourself there. You got motivated, you got in shape, you felt great about it, you're motivating other people, you got your dad to lose weight. That was all you doing it, you pushing it out. Now all of a sudden you've allowed everyone else is opinion to hold value in who you are. You've given them all that value. And because that value has now has been depreciated to a point, now all of a sudden the way you see yourself is different. You're allowing your vision of who you are inside to be mirrored off other people. And it cannot be that way. It has to come from within. You have to see it from within, believe it from within. And everything else, it can change up and down. It doesn't matter. It's the example of a phone call. You're having a terrible day, right? And everything's going wrong and you just want to sleep and you wish you never even got up that day. And the phone rings and it's great news, man. It's just a promotion or, or hey, your best friend's going to make it. He's not going to die or, you know, um, your girlfriend's pregnant or, you know, you just, you just, you know, I don't know, you got the, the whatever it is. All of a sudden you're so dis distraught, depressed and weak, you know, had no energy, that phone call. Nothing came through that phone call to empower you as an individual, no. It's the way you see the day now. At once, dark, you know, loss of light. Now, possibilities and dreams. You hang up the phone motivated, man. Take a shower, get up and, you know, go to the gym or do something else or, you know, life beginning. How about that? It's bullshit, man. Because you're the same person before as you were after. Just the way you see it now has changed. You have hope, you have dreams. When I say depression is a luxury, it is that. It's, it's a luxury for one that's not in a survival mode. When you're depressed, you're, you have the luxury of self-pity. You're allowed to do that. But if you look at nature, there's no depression in there. When someone gets mangled on the field in Africa, some lion or something else, He's not crying anybody. He's fucking trying to live his life. If he dies, he dies. He's trying to live, man. He doesn't ask anyone to feel sorry for him. If you ever seen the movie G.I. Jane, the um, Sergeant Major there in the SEAL community, the actor there, you know, always brings up this poem called Wild Thing. It's about a bird that dies frozen, dead to its barrel and fucking falls to the ground, never feeling sorry for itself. Self-pity is, is a luxury to have. If you're always fighting every single day for survival, you don't have a chance to take a break to feel sorry for yourself. That's why depression is really a luxury. But above all, it's a tool of discovery. It's a discovery of where you've been, where you are. It's a discovery map, map, map basically, on the path that you're, wrong, that you're wrongly on. The reason why you're feeling depressed is because you know the opportunities that once were there are no longer there. Whether they're your existence, whether you created those opportunities to die, or other people have created those opportunities to die. You see that as a path that doesn't lead anywhere. So that right there is a wonderful thing. It's very easy at that point. It's not, I mean, it's not easy to do, but it's easy if you think about the terminology of it all. You, you, you analyze it, you're self-aware, all right, this is no longer suitable. This path doesn't work, I need to move this path. If you're strong enough to face it, then that depression becomes a multiplier in your life to levels of happiness you've never, never experienced before. But until that depression came, when things start to go wrong, the self-awareness, if it doesn't recognize it and you don't face it, then you continue to go down that path and that path and that path. Always kind of show, you know, turning away from whatever the big thing is. And if you try to run from depression, if you try to hide from depression, well, my friend, you cannot run far enough. You can't run fast enough and you can't hide enough. It'll finally find you, and it does find you at that point. So many opportunities have closed, times closed, and it's coming at you with tremendous force. At that point, most people commit suicide. They say goodbye because it's that dark. Depression also means without light. It's that dark, man. It's a self-induced disease. When in that state, you must surround yourself with other people. I'll talk about other things on how to get out of this depression state. But let me tell you a story real fast. I don't know if I've ever told you this story before. This is when I was living in New York. I was living in New York and um, 
I was down in the financial district in Battery Park, and I, I come down Maiden in the morning, uh, the road Maiden, and I get on Broadway, and right by w w Wall Street where the bull is, you know, the running of the bulls, um, and the bull market, I, the Crunch Gym was right there, so we used to work out. And um, so I go there, and I, I lived there for a year or so, and um, I remember like always going there, and between nine and five in the day, there's always this, this, this bum sitting on the street outside this one big financial firm, I forget the name of it, and then there's a, a crunch gym. I always walked by and saw him as I went to the gym, went in the gym, worked out, came back out, saw him, and I didn't take too much notice to him. But over time, I started to see this guy was actually on the schedule. He was always there from nine to five, nine to five, nine to five, every single day, nine to five. And there's something about the guy, he was, he was a little different than most bums because he wore a suit. Yeah, his face was weathered, he needed to shave, he needed a haircut, everything else. But the guy did the best he could to look, to look proper. He was always buttoned up, the tie had a really nice um, Windsor knot on it. Um, he had a, a nice gig line, meaning his shirt line, his belt, and his zipper line all were in alignment, kind of like the military days. His shoes, his shirt was always tucked in. His shoes, you know, obviously need a polish, but you could tell that he, he grabbed a piece of paper or something and tried to shine the best he could. He didn't sit down, but stood. And he stood from nine to five, almost like he was paid to be there. Like he shows up nine to five, kind of like a job. Anyway, I remember vividly, one day I was coming in, I was, I was on this boxing like session uh, with some trainers there and stuff. And um, I came out exhausted, man, it was a hard workout. There was a McDonald's across the street. So I went to the McDonald's, I grabbed like eight, eight cheeseburgers, you know, the dollar menu ones. And um, I wanted to find out what this guy's deal was. So I grabbed the bag, eight cheeseburgers, and I just stood next to him and put the bag like on the podium thing there, the cement block, and um, just opened the bag and just didn't say anything. But I guess I, basically with the, my actions, I said, you're welcome to have one or as many as you need. So I opened one and I ate one, ate the burger, and uh, then I went and grabbed another one. And uh, finally, when I was like, even the second one, he kind of looked over, I go, I gave him a sign, go ahead, help yourself. And he did, he grabbed the burger, um, kind of gave him a little, little half-ass smile. Um, then what I saw, was, uh, it would shock me even more, is that he opened the burger up and, and he started to peel off pickles. And he didn't like that, and, he, and then he took some of the bread off because he didn't want too much bread. I it's kind of weird for someone that's begging, he's, he's choosing now, he's being picky. And I finally said, man, what's the deal, man? What, I don't mean to, to pry or anything else, but if you love to talk to you, man, well, it's, I, I, I see the way you dress and, you know, it's not, you're not quite like most homeless people. Um, it looks like you try to present yourself well. Um, you know, obviously, you see that you're not that hungry or you're just picky because you don't like the pickles or, and he kind of laughed a little bit. And he goes on and tells me a story. I'm there for about an hour with the guy talking. And the, the shorter version of the story is this. Um, he used to be the CEO and the head of a financial firm making hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Um, he was married to the love of his life, of his life, um, and he had three kids. Um, all the kids were in college or out of college, you know, getting married, you know, starting their own families. Um, he lived in Connecticut. He flew a helicopter from Connecticut to the top of his building and landed there and went to work. Um, anyway, he was in Connecticut one night um, for a big award ceremony that he was being presented a financial award of excellence. Um, he got there and gave a speech and stuff, and um, it was a big reception, cocktail hour, and you know a lot of people just you know kind of like sucking his dick, you know you're the best kind of thing. And, um, but his wife was really his love. That was that was his motivation, his driving force. That was a person that really was, you know, I say champions come in pairs of two because they battle themselves in perfection. That was his like his his counterpart in his championship status. He wouldn't be everything he was if it wasn't for the support and love that he got from her. She was really everything to him, kind of like. Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan, they loved each other so much, they kind of almost abandoned their kids away because they loved each other so much. That was kind of their, their MO. Um, so after the end of this ceremony in Connecticut, I think it was in Darien, Connecticut, he was driving home to his house, which is a you know, multi-million dollar place and um, nice car. I mean, really, I mean, the guy worked his ass off, cheated a lot, and uh, very humble in nature and very loving. Just a this is honest, good guy, it seemed like. Um, he had a couple of drinks that night. And uh, next thing he knows, he woke up and he was driving. He woke up and um, he was like in a coma, I guess, like a week and a half or something. Uh, when he finally came to in the hospital, he got the news that his wife didn't make it. You know, his wife died. And um, 
So he didn't get charged for anything. You know, he didn't get charged for drinking and driving or any kind of criminal criminal act. Yeah, but he was released based on his power and status and everything else. Um, but um, he couldn't live without her. His uh, kids kind of looked at him a little differently. Um, and so uh, even though the courts and the, and the law of the land didn't put him into any kind of uh, disciplinary action, he put himself um, in a self-arrest state. He took all of his money, all his possessions, and got rid of them. Um, set up trust for his kids and his grandkids. Um, gave everything away, he sold his house. Um, and then what he did, he thought the best thing he could do, because um, he was so embarrassed and uh, so depressed at what happened and not having the love of his life, that he went back to the streets he owned, where he was the head shot, and everyone kissed his ass, and he was a man. And he made hundreds of millions for everybody, you know, and set up lives, and, and you know, it's just unreal what this guy, you know, accomplished in his life. I won't say his name, um, nor I even know his last name. But um, he went back and sat outside his building, stood there, from doors open of business to the close of business, Monday through Friday. I don't know where he went afterwards, but he didn't sit there. He didn't have a sign or anything else. He just stood there. And a lot of everyone, everyone knew who he was. Uh, they worked that building, and um, he stood. He stood there in self um, arrest, and uh, to let them know that never let your success own you. Never get too far ahead of who you are. Always remember who you are. And he let that go and you know, had an accident and lost all his life and lost his life from it. So he felt by being there, he was providing a service and the best he knew how to. His perception was like, I'm doing the right thing here. And um, God, I was just moved by it, but I was also really irritated by it. And um, I remember yelling at him. And uh, I remember crying a little bit with him. Uh, I got emotional with him. Um, that's kind of fucking who I am. Um, and I told him, I go, um, you know, the, your decision, as admirable as you see it, has a big flaw in it. And that flaw is that the woman you love so much, if you allow this decision and what you're doing to continue until the end of your days, then her reputation, her memory dies with you. But you have the power to share that. You have the power to talk to your grandkids, um, to tell them the stories of this wonderful woman, how much she meant to you, how much she made you better. Um, you know, your stories are all that's left of her life to live. And don't tell me when you, uh, when you, you know, when you hug uh, your grandkid, right? And that isn't the only time that she's allowed to feel the embrace of a grandkid she never knew. Um, the way you see things, he obviously saw it as a mission to teach others of his mistake. I saw it possibly as me as a time period, maybe he served his time, maybe it's time to move on. And um, maybe it's time for him stop teaching his employees or strangers or whatever else, but teach that family the lessons, allow his wife to live on. I mean, that's a story, but it's a perception on how he saw things. The funny thing is, I left, and I was irritated because he kept saying, no, that's not right, I need to stay here, and I, obviously it wasn't making any sense to him, he wasn't hearing what I had to say, or maybe what I had to say. There's another piece of story I didn't know why I left. Um, and he was there every day, man, three, four months, man, every single day. The next day, I never saw him again. I don't know where he went. Um, I was there for another five, six months before I moved to LA. I never saw him again. I like to think he moved on and um, and went back to his family. I like to think. I mean, maybe, you know, went somewhere else. I don't know. But I'm hoping, by saying this story, I'm hoping that, you know, he was able to look at the situation differently. Yes, there's tough times and everything else. And he thought, this is, you know, this is my punishment. I need to do this. And he was agreeing by that. But, you know, another person talking to another person, maybe he saw another perspective to it. Another way to pay it forward. Another way to pay for those mistakes. Not in a, a self indulgence of depression, but in a way of motivation um, 
of speaking to others of how he did wrong and how not to do and learn from my mistakes mentality. Um, I bring that up because the perception of how you see things are so much more powerful than the actual events itself. I was at West Point in my sophomore year on a skydiving team, and um, I was on my own, man. Um, I was working my ass off, and as hard as I worked, I couldn't get ahead. You know, like crazy hours of schoolwork, and then like duties and military obligations, and it's like 40 hours you can do a day, but it's only 24 hours in the day, and we haven't even talked about sleeping. So over time, it's like, it teaches you to, you know, have priorities in life. Yeah, you can't get everything done, so one of the most important things, that was a lesson, that's why they put so much on in single day's events. Um, you know, I didn't know that, so I tried to do everything, tried to do everything, and you can't do everything. And the saying is, cooperate to graduate. You know, the team is stronger than the individual, so you cooperate with others in order to graduate. If you do it as your own, by yourself, you're gonna fail, you can't take it all on. You have to delegate and task orient, and um, so uh, I tried, and I was failing miserably, and I was just really down on myself. I didn't see the opportunities of West Point. I didn't see the challenges. I got absorbed by them, but I was just failing and failing and failing. To the point, one day at practice for skydiving, um, when you jump out, there's two chutes. There's a reserve chute that's packed by a master rigger, and then there's your main that you pack. So if you have a bad pack job and you put a pull and it doesn't open up, well then you can deploy your reserve and you still hit, basically. Um, now if you were to jump out and you hit your head on the wind and you go unconscious and you're falling dead to the earth, there's a little computer thing called a cypress on top of your reserve that reads how fast you're falling. And if you fall at a certain speed and you go through a certain ceiling, you know, it fires your reserve automatically. So I was at a state of, of uh, depression and, and denial and loss. You know, very lost, and so I jumped out, put my hands in the air, and I didn't pull anything. I go, let's see if this thing works. And if it doesn't work, I'm okay with it. Um, and I fell, I looked it up my altimeter. I'm supposed to fire around a thousand feet. Uh, the Cypress for your reserve. I put it right through a thousand. I was like 800, uh, maybe 700 feet. And I was like, and I didn't do anything. I just looked down and I said, no longer have any problems. You know, that's how low I was. Um, and then I felt this pull and it fired my reserve. Um, the coaches came running up, like, what happened? Did it not it open? What happened? What, what? I made up some story, man. I was too embarrassed to tell them the truth that, um, you know, that I caught, I created this. As soon as I landed, I was like, the air smelled different. Um, I felt like I had a second chance for some reason. There's a purpose for me to keep going on. I started looking at the struggle, saying if I don't want to do this anymore, I can always walk away. But before I walk away, let me leave my, my best effort forward. Let me really give a balanced effort here. And so if I do walk away, I leave everything here so I don't have any piece of me left here to look back on and wonder what could I have done better. I didn't want to wonder if. So I went back that next evening after practice. Totally different mentality. Totally different way of looking at it. Same situation, same problem, same stress, same crazy schedule, but the way I saw it was different. And then I soared and exceeded and excelled in the marketplace. Um, graduated, you know, everything about it was awesome. But it was the same issue as the way I saw it. Now I'm not saying you go through a near death experience or you try to commit suicide and if you, and if you live, then you keep on. No, it's not my, what the, 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 the theme here is that it's the way we see things. And right now, Pete, the way you're seeing it right now is that, um, yeah, you know, thank God for my girlfriend. If it wasn't for her, I don't have a reason to smile. You just gave yourself all, you just took all the power away from yourself. Your best friend died, it sucks. Get over it. That's part of life. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had friends die in the military. My dog's about to die. Um, you know, if you look at nature itself, there's a cyclical lifespan. Everything dies and there's a winter, spring, and summer. That's life. That's how it is. It's how we deal with these things in life that we find out who we are. And if we deal with them in the correct way, then we really get the real blessings of life, the real power moments that really stand the test of time. But most of those moments, they don't come... Um, they, they don't come presented to you. No one can give them to you. You have to earn them. 
those moments are like getting up in the morning and training your ass off for a marathon and the day you cross that finish line, the exhilaration of victory, the way you feel, as great as that is, people watch it, the Boston Marathon that was the other day, people coming across the line, you look at it, you're like, wow, I want to be part of that. Well, that moment was paid for through, through you know, years maybe or months of training when no one was watching and no one wanted to do it. They paid their time for that. You know, these moments of depression when things go wrong, once you overcome them, you become stronger from them. And it's that moment in life later that is built upon failure, same with success. Success is never gotten on the first time usually. It's failure to failure to failure, learning from your failures from one to another to another. You know, trying, even if you get knocked down, you continue to try and continue to try. And ensuring you never fail to try. It's, it, it's, it's that mentality. It's the mentality, bring it on, motherfucker. I can take it. You can't break this shit. I'm stronger than you think I am. And everything you throw at me and all the hardships you throw at me, you might knock me down, but I get back up and I'll be stronger for it. It's that mentality that builds an iconic status that, that centuries from now people still talk about. The small pitfalls in life, the, um, the deaths in families, or a girl breaking up with you, getting fired from a job, losing your money, these are all lessons. They really are. They're just the, the presence in a way. But it's the perception of how you see that present. Do you allow it to destroy you or do you allow it to change you? Is it a wake up call saying, hey, gotta get off this path onto something else? It's a state of mind, guys. It's not a state of reality. I can't say that enough. Um, if you're going through depression, you know, there is a chemical depression. You know, over time and stuff. And I'm not a psychiatrist, guys. I'm not going through that. I've never been to a psychiatrist. Um, you know, I don't know about the drugs and everything else. I think one drug just masks another drug. If you need this drug, then you need another drug. And you go down this fucking drug war. You know, if you guys seen The Wolf of Wall Street, the fucker did uppers and he had to bring downers and he did enough coke here. And he was just fucking drug back and forth like playing ping pong with each other for high to low to keep it, you know, or wipe it all clean. And we take charge of ourselves. Same with supplementation and getting ready for cover shoots. People are like, hey, do you take water retention pills? Do you take steroids? Do you take this? No, I don't take any of that shit. Because I cannot rely on that every single time for success. One day my body might reject it. Or maybe I'm holding too much water and the, the water pills I always use, I always tell me, aren't working. And then my reputation's on the line and I can't, for, can't provide. I don't like that scenario. That scenario it, it is a busted situation. I can never repeat success that way. A true successful module takes the element of risk or any kind of luck or any kind of intangible third party things like your girlfriend can. You're giving her too much power. Love her, but she does not create you. You must be who you are. She enhances you, but without her, you are still yourself, still strong, still capable. You can, she cannot be your Achilles heel, your crutch. She doesn't deserve that, it's too much pressure. If you really loved her, you wouldn't put that much responsibility on her. There are times in life where you lean on one and they lean on you, but it's a temporary thing, it's not a permanent thing. Same with, you know, getting ready for shoots or competitions you guys doing in physique um, shows and stuff. You can't, you can't take steroids. You can't take water retention pills. You can't take all these things to try to get ahead of the system because one day it's not going to be there for you. You can't rely everything of your confidence on your coach. I need, I need to talk to my coach, man. I need his motivation. Man, then you're not really the champion. You better cut that trophy in half, give him half of it because you aren't really everything. You gotta find a system of success where you are running it from start to finish and everything in between. You control all the modules. If you control them all, then you can repeat them all. And when you keep repeating them all, then you start to have achievements. You're going down the path. Hard work produces an outcome. Hard work produces a higher outcome. Harder work produces a greater outcome. That's, that's success, man. And true happiness runs parallel with progress. That progress is every day you're getting better. Yeah, you fail, but you went a little further, went a little further. Progression runs parallel with happiness. Depression, for one, one is the current tense of a word called regret. Depression is the present tense of a word called regret. And if you continue to go down that path, 
where there is no progression. You know, there also isn't any happiness. No progression. It's like a water that's stagnant. It's not moving. You're not in motion. You're sitting there wondering, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Nothing comes from a steady state. You've got to get up and go. How do you beat depression, man? If you're feeling lost and everything else, and that it's dark and there's no way out and everything else, it, it's, 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 you've lost your perspective of life. Yeah, that phone could, ring, could, could be good news. Maybe that happens for you and it kind of jump starts you. It's like the, uh, the, those pallets they put on you if you're dying and this electric shock you to kind of jump start. Maybe you get lucky with that phone call. Maybe good news comes your way. But let's say that doesn't happen because you cannot do that every single time because you will be depressed over and over and over again as part of life. It's part of a challenge that you should welcome because it's really a, a, a tool of discovery, like I've said, that you can learn so much from if you're strong enough to face it and learn from it. Most people hide from it and they press them self pity, feel sorry for me, and they're just hoping for somebody to come help them. But if that person doesn't come, it gets deeper and deeper. It's a cancer that can't cure, cure itself. How do you beat it? One, you gotta get on a routine. Don't take naps during the day and everything else. Get up at six, go to sleep at 11 or at, at 10 and do that. Stick to it. Get on a routine. You get up in the morning, you go to the gym, whatever you're gonna do, you go to work, you go to church if you want to, you go to a social setting, or you go out walking the dogs, and you go to sleep. You read a book, you get on a program. You get away from the alcohol, you get away from the drugs, any kind of third party thing that's gonna alter your mind. You start eating right, because people get depressed and start eating fucking chocolate and ice cream. Bad food creates lethargic feelings in a press state that you're coming off the program of excellence. And it, 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 bad food, it's, it's a bad mentality, a bad outlook on life. Good food, you feel good about yourself. It rewards the body, it's what your body wants. It pushes you to a higher level. Everyone, when they get depressed, they just self-loathe it and, and they eat bad. They, then they start drinking and they start doing drugs. You know, and, and all that stuff is just putting more logs on the fire to burn the depression hotter and stronger. And it's all starting right in here. You are creating it. And then we're manifesting it. Getting on a routine. A solid sleeping pattern. Eating correct foods. Getting the chemicals out of our body allows us to come back to a zero balance of who we really are, where our perspective can actually see what's really happening. And then we can look at it. And when we look at it, we look for the good in everything. We don't get boggled down with the bad. It's, oh, everyone can do that. Look for the silver linings. Even if they're so small, just grow that. And then go ahead again and see if they get a little bit bigger, a little bit better, a little bit better. And it'll start to come out. You start to see that progress. When you start to see progress, you start to, see, start to have a purpose, start to have happiness. Happiness will reverse the flip on the corner of depression. It's the EKG. It'll go up, it'll come back down. That's how it goes. And why does it come back down? Because you risk it. You go for it. You're going after dreams, man. You believe in yourself. Everyone says, well, you shouldn't do that. You should take it easy. Just coast. You've achieved enough. That's a very dangerous road, man. You start to rely on your success. You're no longer the man then. You're past accomplishments of the man. You're just a guy at forefront, a state head of someone else's accomplishments. Yeah, the years, but the five, ten years ago. When I was wrestling in high school and stuff and won the state championships a couple of years. You know, that's great. Do I still talk about it now? If I did, what the fuck happened in the last 20 years? You can't have success to find who you are. You must define it. You learn from it and everything else. And that way, you, every single day, you're building more and more and more things. And then you go for something and you lose and it comes crashing down and you build it back up. That's, that's the, the cyclical nature of life and nature. And in nature, guys, you know Steve Jobs, um, just a genius, a creative, a business, I mean, um, just an amazing individual. Um, died well before his time and lived a life that many would never live as fulfilled as he had. Um, his business meetings were walking, man. He walked miles and miles, like, I don't know how many miles of a week, but I mean, just wore out some tennis shoes, I bet. Whenever he was down and out, whatever else, he just go walking. In nature, being outside, there's so many natural commotions of the human body, the mindset, that is seen visually in nature. The life, the, the, the seasons, the, the way a river runs and, and hits a block and goes around. There's so many metaphors that you're not alone. Most depressed states feels like you are alone. The lights are out. There's no help. There's, 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 there's no hope left. That is the worst disease in the world. 
the thing is, you create that disease. You don't eat bad food and get some food poisoning, or you don't get f um, food depression. You know, you don't get it from like uh, you, you drank too much alcohol. You you got you know you drunk depression. But sometimes that happens. Um, but for the most part, all this stuff is like you, you not putting the work in, or you're doing the wrong thing, the wrong path. And you continue to do it on a cyclical pattern, and what happens is shit results, shit results, and then you start to see those results as who you are. But you can't do any better than that. So then you start to identify yourself. Like I said, success you never identify. Success can never identify who you are. You must always identify it. You're allowing your failures to identify who you are. Whether it's success or failure, it can never identify who you are. This is a moment of time where you gave it your best. Now, if you gave up, you didn't give it your best, and you're honest about it, you see that depressed state because you failed. But if you really look at it honestly, the message right there, the tool of discovery is that, yeah, well, I went out the night before, or I didn't train as hard. I, I started two months too, too late. I, you know, I didn't train as hard as I could as some of the other people. Well, when I was doing the event, you know, it started to hurt. I gave up. So I start, all right, all right. So it doesn't mean I'm a failure. It means I, my work wasn't championship enough to win and beat the other people who are working just as hard as you. You're not entitled to the success of it. You're entitled for a fair showing, to show off all of your hard work and accomplishments to that point. Is it enough? I don't know. Maybe someone trained harder. If so, if you left it all there, that's a win, man. We'll go back and train harder and see if we can improve on our last success. But we can't look at it and be defined by, we didn't, we came up short, so we are short. It doesn't work that way, we can't be that way. The other thing about having to deal with depression, get creative, guys. Goal-oriented, creative things. Little things, man, like, you see me doing a lot of these construction videos, you think why, you know why I do those construction videos? Or why I build things? Because a lot of the goals I have in life are year-long, or five-year-long, or decade-long goals, are big fucking goals. It's very hard in a 10-year process to see the daily ins and outs if we're on path or not, if we're on the right track. There's not a report card coming back every week or every day. It comes back every, every couple of years, or every year, or something like that. How do you know you're on track, you know? I'm a very competitive person. You know, I need to be doing something. And I feel good when I step outside the box and I take a vision of a patio or something and rebuild it into something. Do some hard work, sweat my ass off, build something, think about things, then it stands there in a short period of time, check, report card, success, like it. I take that energy, I feel good about that, man. Yeah, I love that, it's creative, that's awesome. I did that positive nature, I, I did that. And I take it into something else that isn't moving as fast or isn't as progressive um, in a state of progression that I want to be. And I take all that positive energy that I just created out there and I throw it into this event. And bam, it starts to move in the direction I want. Or I go outside and I cut the lawn. It takes me an hour, you know? And after that hour, boom, looks sharp. Looks like people wanna come with the golf clubs and tee it up, it's like a fucking golf course, man. Or I go to the backyard and I pull the weeds out of the garden. There's power there, man. Don't call me crazy, there's power there. You're pulling something out, you're getting rid of the weeds, but physically, but in your life, you're thinking about shit. And at the end of it all, it's a check, achievement, small little goal. Sense of satisfaction, just as big. Positive feeling. Taking that positive feeling, putting it into something that you're not feeling so good about. Starting to see the coin flip in your direction. What you want it to be. You know, if you're not into construction or anything like that, man, you know, I went to a painting class, man. Always challenge yourself, man. Step outside the box. I went to a painting class. Man, they have a canvas and future little things. At the end of it all, you know, I painted like these palm trees. Man, I've never painted it before. I'll go grab that fucking painting and I'll show you. You know, and I love it, man. It was a cool process. One, I got outside the box. Whatever I was ingrained in, I'm thinking so much about and all depressed about. But I wasn't even thinking about any of that stuff. I was painting. I'm like, eh. You know? And it actually was pretty fucking good painting. I went back a couple more times. I enjoyed that. You know, getting creative, doing something like that. Going for a run, going for a walk, walking the dogs, going to the gym. It's a release, man. Those kind of things, man. Small little goals, daily, things that are achievable. Seeing a sense of return of time and investment. Seeing a sense of achievement. Positive, take that positive, keep that going. You know, in the military, it's called false motivation. Even though the task sucks, 
You know, you know, as a leader, you, you have to motivate the uninspired. Even though they know it's shit, you have to make this shitty mission feel like the most pivotal part of the battalion's operation. If we don't achieve this, man, everything else will domino effect. Wrong. This is how vital this is. And they feel like a purpose. There's a meaning behind it. There's something on the line. They go for it. They're challenged by it. They're not thinking it's a bullshit mission or anything else. It's a perspective on how you see it. These missions were oh crap, they're totally crap. They had nothing to do with anything. Whether we did it or not, it was irrelevant. If I were to say that to the soldiers, ah, the, the, the fucking job they would have done would have been irrelevant too, and shit. But I did it, I dressed it up. You know, I false motivated them, saying, hey, everything rides on this. And I, I, I backed it up on why. And then they're like, holy shit, man, we, let's fucking make this happen. And they did better than everyone thought they could. That's leadership right there. But what it really is, is taking the situation and creating the right perspective to it. You can't dwell on this shit, can. That's what you're doing, you're dwelling in it. And the things you're dwelling in, we're outside of your realm, man. That's what blows my mind. You're the same person that you said, I've lost every fucking thing, you know? You haven't lost anything. You just can't see it anymore. You've allowed yourself to, to, be, to be robbed by it. You robbed your own self. It sounds weird, right? You're the same guy that can get up at six in the morning. The same guy that can go to the gym. You're the same physique that people always look at. You know, you, you, that did lose 20 pounds. You can't take that away. You lost 20 pounds. These are all facts. You didn't lose your leg. Your girlfriend's not dead. You didn't kill your boyfriend. Your parents are still alive, still love you, you still love each other. Stop looking at it as like, oh my God, it's all upside down, it's all my fault. You didn't have that piece in any of this puzzle. But you're allowing their things to somehow rob you of what the things you can do. You're seeing the wrong story here. Now I told you that shitty story, you know, that yeah, you're driving the car, your, your friend dies on your behalf. It's your fault. Your girlfriend gets, becomes a paraplegic. You lose a, a limb where you can't work out anymore. And your parents, now are getting divorced, but hate each other. And one killed the other one, the other was in jail. Wow. Glad that's not the truth. But if it was, wouldn't you give up everything you had to come to the truth of the letter you just wrote? Yeah, you would. So stop looking at it as like the worst case scenario. It can get worse, but it can get better. The way you see it is the first step of creating that change. All right, guys, this is um, yeah, a tough one, man, and, and you know, I'm not a psychiatrist or anything else, but I go through this a lot, man. I go through the depression state a lot. Um, you know, one, is, it's kind of my fault because I believe I can achieve so many things. Uh, I think I'm capable of doing things, and if I don't achieve them fast enough, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm losing my edge and stuff. So I have this problem, too, because I base a lot of who I am on my success, my achievements. But I haven't had a cover for a while. I'm like, oh man, I'm losing it, I'm losing it. Better get a cover. Then I get a cover and I feel okay. But it's temporary now. I feel okay for a minute. That can't be what you're made of. That can't be, like, I'm, I'm fucked up. I'm wrong in this, man. I need to fix it myself. It's a struggle all the time, man. I'm over to that struggle. I'm looking forward to the journey. I'm looking forward to trying to figure out the contentness. You know, not being satisfied, but being content. Give it my all. Enjoying the process, not be identified by the success of it, the end state of it, but learning along the way. That's the struggle I go through. I go through it all the time. I, I've gone through it in the military and careers and relationships, I mean, everything, man. You know, all of a sudden you break up with a girl, man, life you're, it looks bad. And you meet a new girl, man, and all of a sudden you feel great. Figure out what that is. It's your endorphins, it's your emotions, it's your hormones, it's inside of you. You can turn it on, turn it off, you can keep it on, keep it off. You know, they say, um, you know, people can help you do it, you know, um, but no one can do it for you. Um, I mean, if you don't do it, they, they, their help can help you get there, but if you're not doing anything, they can't get it for you, you know what I mean? It really comes down to you, and it's the way you see things. And there's two options, Ken, or for anyone who's depressed, for me, when I'm depressed or anything else, stay depressed or get healthy. They're the options, man. And as, as simple as I say that, it's like, 
it's like matrix. Do you want the red pill or the green pill? Um, you know, it's like, it's your choice. And it starts right now, like this minute, not tomorrow, it's this minute, right now. Boom, all right, wow, okay, how do I do that? I'm not sure, I'm just looking for a job, I'm looking for a job, I'm looking for a job. But you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna write a letter to my parents saying, you know what, I know you guys aren't in love with each other anymore, but I love you guys, and I always will, and I love our family, and um, you, know, you know, you guys both mean the world to me. And just send a letter to them, you know? There's, there's peace in that, there's a closure in that. Um, you know, it's the small little things, but it's uh, they add up to be the monumental things. And at the end of the day, the small things like pulling the weeds in the garden and that mundane bullshit task, it creates a purpose. You have a sense of fulfillment, success, and you achieve something, and that's the motion. That's what you need to keep that wheel moving. And you take that back and, I mean, there's so many times I've come home and I'm just worn the fuck out, man, I'm tired, and I've had a bad day, everything's going wrong and everything else. I just wanna go to sleep, man, but I don't. I don't go to sleep, because I've gone to sleep so many times in that scenario, right? I've gone to sleep so many times in that scenario, and it's just, it's never, I wake up more depressed. So instead of going to sleep, I know what happens if I go to sleep, I'm still depressed. So instead of going to sleep, I go to the gym. Right, even though I'm tired, everything else going wrong, I go to the gym, the outcome of going to the gym, what happens is I come back, you know, expended more energy, but more alive than ever. The problems I had, I'm thinking about when I'm in the gym. I'm lifting while I'm thinking about them. My mind's thinking faster and everything else. I'm achieving things. The problems don't look as big anymore. I find solutions. I'm on a treadmill running, and as I'm running, I'm thinking about the speed because I'm thinking about my problems. And I'm finding solutions. It's like my mind's running, my brain's thinking faster, and boom, well, once the problems still exist, but the way I see them now are different. It, or I could have gone to sleep. You know, I woke up with the same problems. Probably just as tired. The way you see, guys, the way you see it, it's depression or positive self-perception. And it's in your control. Thanks for watching. By the way, here's that fucking painting I did, man. Huh? Look at that fucking tequila sunrise, huh? Not bad, huh? That's right. I didn't know how to do this. But what I'm saying is that you got to go out and try things. You'll never know until you try. And guess what, man? I kind of enjoyed this. You're my new little backdrop. I kind of enjoy doing this. How many things are you robbing yourself from that you might really enjoy because you're in a depressed state, state of mind, self paralysis, that oh, I don't want to go, I don't want to go out. There's times like my friends call me up, I got work to do. They're like, hey man, meet us out, do this. I'm like, no, I don't want to, man, I don't want to. But maybe one day I did. And when I was there, man, dude, I met somebody or good friends or maybe I met a girl or something or dating. Who knows what happens? It's the audition of life. If you don't show up, you know the outcome. Nothing, no callback. But if you show up as a possibility of something, if you stay at your house and you stay in a depressed state, you know the outcome. It gets worse and worse and worse. It's a positive cancer, it's a snowball effect. It gets harder and harder and harder that you self create and you can never beat back. It's a parasite feeding off you, the host, pulling all your energy, all your confidence, all your ability, your potential, your outlook. Everything's dark. You allow that to happen. You can turn it off just as fast. You can go out and try something new. Find, some, find another beauty of life, there's a million of them. But your perspective of it, if you don't see it, it doesn't exist, I don't care. Just like the truth, as bad as it is, it's not as powerful as how you perceive it. You can find the silver linings in it. That perspective can be a positive or negative, you can see it as death. Like what you're saying, Cam, you can think like your whole life's ending right now as you're 17 years old. You can, you can do that, guess what will happen? No one's gonna come save you, you run and die. I'm not saying physically die, but your life is never going to reach the prosperity, the dreams you think it ever, ever could be. Or you can turn it. You have the power to do that. That's why depression really is a tool of self-examination, a tool of, of reflection. It's a luxury in its own right because you're not in a survival state. You're in a self-pity state. It's, it, it's, a, it's a tool of self-discovery. So when you see it's depression, don't think about it as, oh, everything's going wrong. Think, all right, this depression, right? There's a way out. This is, it, it's not gonna sugarcoat it for me. It's not gonna highlight what the problem is. But the, the secret, the way out, the path out is right here. Let me really look at it. Let me be strong enough and face it. And when you face it, you're gonna find a way out. And when you find your way out to that depression, when you look back on depression, you're stronger for it. So therefore, it's a multiplier in your life for something greater.